what's going down. tells me it's 7 p.m. Are, are we good to go? Do we have the, the online folks? Are, are, are we good? Are we ready? No technical glitches? Everything is good to go. All right, colleagues, friends, welcome. Good evening. My name is Marvin Reed. Um, I'll be your host uh, for the program today. Um, which is entitled Protection from the Start, Hypertension in the Kidney. This program represents a partnership between the Caribbean College of Family Physician as well as Dr. Reddy's Laboratories. Um, before we actually get into the meat of the matter and I give the official welcome, I'll just allow Dr. Reddy to briefly give us a video presentation. All right? Is that lined up? Are we ready to go? <laughs> In 1984, our founder, Dr. K. Anji Reddy, set up Dr. Reddy's laboratories to bring medicines within everybody's reach around the world. And for about four decades, we have been working towards one clear purpose, driving access and affordability to innovative medicines, because good health can't wait. In all these years, we have supported our patients and stakeholders by fulfilling our key promises, while our principles and our values have guided us to where we are today. From manufacturing bulk drugs to growing into a world-class integrated pharmaceutical company with a diverse and robust portfolio, we have come a long way. As a leading global pharma company today, we are led by our core tenets of deep science capabilities, progressive people practices, and strong focus on corporate governance. Our continued success rests on three strategic pillars. Through market leadership, our core businesses of API, generics, branded generics, biosimilars, and OTC have led the way for us. We have expanded our presence across India, North America, Europe and the emerging markets and we aim to reach 1.5 billion patients. We deliver on our promises to patients through productivity by strengthening our capabilities in manufacturing operations, building an agile supply chain and integrated cost structures. Productivity is also driven by digital initiatives that touch the entire pharma life cycle. First, we aim to strengthen the primary value chain by applying digital science in R&D, accelerating drug development timelines. We are also one of the earliest adopters of Industry 4.0 technologies in manufacturing operations among pharma companies in India, working towards building factories of the future. Second, we are transforming the customer-patient journey by introducing key digital initiatives that elevate user experience. These include platforms for Salesforce excellence, best-in-class knowledge-sharing platforms for healthcare professionals, and digital native business models such as SFAS, a first-of-its-kind comprehensive digital outpatient offering. We aim to create healthcare solutions through innovation. Over the years, our legacy of pioneering several APIs and finished drugs, exporting APIs at scale, initiating novel drug discovery in the 1990s, introducing several molecules in India for the first time, being the first in India to receive 180-day exclusivity from the US FDA, and the first to market several high-value complex generics have helped us meet unmet medical needs of patients. 
We led the industry in taking bold steps and breaking new frontiers in our core areas of expertise. Now, with our dedicated innovation unit leading the way, we are embarking on our next leg of growth with a focus on new segments. Our journey has been marked by the trust our patients, partners and stakeholders place in us. We are inspired by our strong sense of purpose, committed to giving back to the communities that help us thrive. We actively work towards raising awareness about good health. We are passionate about reducing our impact on the environment and conserving precious resources. Sustainability is central to our purpose and strategy. In 2004, we released our first sustainability report and were among the earliest companies in India to initiate voluntary disclosures on social and environmental aspects. In 2020, we became the first pharma company in India and the third in Asia to join the Science Based Targets Initiative to set science targets for ourselves. We have been featured as a member of the S&P Sustainability Yearbook for two years in a row. Featured in the Emerging Markets category in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for six years in a row and many more. Our principle of dynamism drives us to create value for our shareholders. Our principle of empathy guides our strong leadership team and progressive people practices. We invest in talented, capable people and help them grow into the professionals they are meant to be. Our proactive policies on diversity and inclusion have made us the only Indian pharma company to be featured on the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index five times in a row. All these aspects make us the partner of choice for leading organizations globally and our efforts have been recognized by several prestigious organizations. As the healthcare industry moves into the future, we look forward to serving our patients and partners better and reinforcing our place as a global pharmaceutical company by leveraging technology and innovation. Moving forward, we will continue to strengthen our core and build the future. Because good health can't wait. Right, right. Good health certainly cannot wait. Colleagues, again, um, just like to say a good evening to those of us who are here in person and for those of us who are online. This meeting is a hybrid meeting, and so I'm advised that we do have some audience um, online with us this evening. Just want to take a few minutes to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Patnick, country head, um, Dr. Reddy. Um, welcome, sir, and thanks for your, your sponsorship of this evening. And Mr. Shakawat, marketing manager, also from Dr. Reddy's. As stated earlier, I'm Marvin Reed, uh, here in my capacity as president of the Caribbean College of Family Physician. And for those of you who are not aware, the Caribbean College of Family Physicians is a grouping of family physicians whose underlying philosophy is that primary health care um, is really the mechanism or tool to improve the health of our peoples. And we do that because of the fact that we believe that as physicians, there is an importance to um, dedicating ourselves to the craft as well as to up grade our skills um, through scholarship. This activity this evening is just one such mechanism through which we will continue our quest to improve our skills, competence, and knowledge to manage important health problems within the country and within the region. Today, we will be discussing 
interventions as it relates to hypertension and the kidneys. Hypertension, as we know, is one of the common in, um, chronic non-communicable disease that affects us in here in Jamaica. And together with diabetes, contributes to the burden of chronic kidney disease. We recognize, therefore, that as a society, that we really don't have the resources, both individually and collectively, to handle the expected tsunami of chronic kidney failure that will emerge if we don't manage the diabetes and the hypertension, as well as some of the other modifiable risk factors for chronic, non for chronic kidney disease, which um, Dr. Smith uh, will be sharing with us later today. Um, and so therefore, within that context, we also recognize that as a society that is predominantly of Afro, African descent, that there are differential outcomes um, for these chronic disease. Um, and unfortunately for us, one of that differential is manifested in the existence or excess morbidity and mortality associated with kidney problems. So therefore, colleagues, what I've really just said is really just to set the foundation for why, as a college, we thought that this was an important topic for discussion and why we engaged um, in a partnership with Dr. Reddy to bring our membership and others up to date as to how it is that we can contribute to mitigating the burden of kidney problems in our persons or subjects or clients or family members who may have hypertension. This evening, um, we will be graced with Dr. Roger Smith, a nephrologist, who is no stranger to those of us who practice here in Jamaica. I must share with you that Dr. Smith had the unfortunate experience of serving seven years of his secondary school life at Campion College. <laughs> you may ask why it's unfortunate. That's because he didn't go to Arden. Notwithstanding that, or in spite of that, um, he's a graduate, so he's a Pelican, so he's a graduate of our University of the West Indies Medical School. And following medical school, he did postgraduate training in internal medicine and subsequently did subspecialist training in nephrology and transplant medicine. Dr. Smith has over 20 years of experience working in the field of internal medicine and nephrology. And I've had the distinct honor of working with him in co-managing several patients. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I would just like you to formally welcome to the podium. Uh, he promised me that he would be nice and short um, this evening, so he will not be like our Minister of Finance. Good night, everyone, colleagues, those online and those in person. Uh, thank you, Professor Reed, for that introduction. And thank you to Dr. Redis for allowing me to speak on a topic that I find very interesting. Now, as Prof. Reed said, we are facing a tsunami of non-communicable diseases. Chronic kidney diseases prevalence worldwide is at about 13.4%. That is a tremendous number of patients. And if we're looking at Jamaica, as a population and the risk factors of our people, then we realize that we have many of the risk factors that can lead into chronic kidney disease. Over 50% of Jamaicans are overweight or obese, for example. 31% have hypertension and 12% have diabetes. <laughs> All right. So, if we think about the burden of the disease in Jamaica, and we think about 150,000 Jamaicans possibly living with kidney disease, and then we reflect on the number of renal clinics that we have, and we think about the amount of dialysis units that we have, we should immediately realize that we literally have no chance of actually treating all of these patients should they progress. Therefore, our entire focus needs to be on prevention, all right? CKD by itself 
is not the cause of death in most of these patients. And I wonder if the numbers are, are higher than what we see actually reported on this slide, simply because CKD causes death by CVD, cardiovascular disease. So they're going to record the stroke or the heart attack, but it's CKD that is the risk multiplier, all right? So you can miss that, and these, and I'm expecting that these numbers are actually underreported, all right? If we take a look at just the diabetes clinics, and we can see that 22% of patients had an EGFR less than 60 mils. CKD was present in 86.3% of those patients based on criteria, the albumin criteria as a marker of kidney damage, and 62.1% of those patients with CKD had severe albuminuria greater than 300 milligrams per gram, which puts them in the highest quartile for risk for death by cardiovascular disease. Now, you may wonder why we're talking about uric acid this early in the presentation. We already know that hypertension and diabetes are risk factors. We know obesity is a driver for diabetes. We understand all of that. However, there are novel risk factors that, we, that are coming up that may also impact kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. And one of these novel risk factors is the serum uric acid level because it has been shown in multiple studies that elevated serum uric acid actually poses a direct risk for cardiovascular disease and progression of CKD. Now, as CKD progresses, hyperuricemia tends to occur. If hyperuricemia is a driver for CVD and CKD, then that would lead to a vicious cycle where you'd end up with hyperuricemia leading to more CKD, which leads to more hyperuricemia, which leads to cardiovascular disease. And since cardiovascular disease death rates are multiplied in people with CKD, then that would be a very serious problem. So there are studies that have shown that in the highest risk patients, Hyperuricemia may actually increase the risk of CKD by three times, especially those in, in those that are hypertensive. And there are genetic conditions that can predispose you to hyperuricemia as well as CKD, but we're not generally talking about those. The mechanism for this is not yet fully understood. Now, if we go back into the evidence, looking back at the studies that have been done on this topic, you will see that there are two basic um, timelines here. In the early, in the early days, um, people were very excited because allopurinol, a drug that, that we usually use for gout, was found to actually reduce the rate of progression to CKD. Now, this, this was actually presented at an um, ASN conference one year when I was there. And one of the major problems with allopurinol is that it tends to cause tubular interstitial nephritis in some patients as well as various other things that are involving the bone marrow. So the thought that a drug that we were told that we should probably avoid was actually found to, to reduce the risk of progression, that was kind of surprising. So everybody started to look at uric acid and basically everybody started to see that uric acid was a contribution in multiple separate studies, albeit small, to cardiovascular disease and CKD. However, as time went on, we found that although there was a correlation between uric acid and chronic kidney disease and decline in GFR, it wasn't concrete enough. And the, 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 the what's the word now, K. Digo decided that they would in fact not be placing uric acid in the role of an actual risk factor for CKD at this time, but it would be considered a molecule of some concern. And similarly, we have the same type of evidence, the same pattern of evidence with cardiovascular disease. All right? Some of the mechanisms that have been put forward are actually on this slide where they, they believe that high uric acid levels can actually change the phosphorylation of nitric oxide synthesis and thus affect endothelial function, all right? which would be the major driver by which a lot of the morbidity and the, the driving of the CKD could occur. Hmm? Now, hypertension is a very, very old risk factor, right? It's not a novel risk factor, and it is the topic of tonight. I would think the most important part of tonight's talk. Hypertension and its control 
is paramount, both in reducing the risk of CKD progression, as well as reducing incidence in cardiovascular disease. Now, there are several bodies that have given out guidelines on what hypertension is, when does it begin, um, what numbers we need to control patients to. And if you look at this slide, you will find that these bodies tend to disagree in some areas. And this can be a source of some confusion. I am not confused by this though, and neither should you, <laughs> all right? Everybody can decide where a cutoff, anybody can decide where a cutoff needs to be on a continuum of risk, all right? So what you have to look at the things that are actually common between the guidelines. On this slide, you can see that everybody agrees that chronic kidney disease is dangerous, and that it, is a, it puts patients in a higher risk group just by virtue of being diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. Now, ACA and AHA may cut off hypertension. They say that above 130 over 80, you're hypertensive. And if you're between 120 to 130, maybe you're prehypertensive, right? Now, when, we, when I was training, the idea of calling somebody hypertensive at 131 over 81 was not on the books. That's, that was crazy, all right? We thought hypertension started after 140 over 90. And evidently, so do the Europeans, mostly, depending on who you're looking at, right? Now, the reason for this, I think, is due to the fact that we have to look not only at the guideline itself, but the way you are measuring the blood pressure, all right? So if you have a patient come into your office, run, right, take a bus from halfway tree, nearly get hit by a taxi, run out, walk up your stairs, sit down in your office, and then you take the blood pressure, and, you, and that is the setting you're taking the blood pressure in, then perhaps you would want to consider hypertension starting at about 140 over 90, right? But if you put that patient in a room for 30 minutes to relax, there's no nurse in the room. It's quiet, some nice soothing music is playing. All right, they're sitting in a chair. Their, their back is upright. Their legs are parallel to the floor and their feet are flat on the floor. Their arm is outstretched at the height of the heart without any effort by them and supported. The cuff is mid arm and in line with the left ventricle. At that point, when they are not speaking, a machine could then take the blood pressure, three readings, very quietly, and at that time, if their blood pressure is greater than 130 over 80, maybe we should think that they might have a problem. So it comes down to how you're taking the pressure and the setting that you're in. Now in Jamaican clinics, all right, patients arrive at six o'clock for some reason, even though the clinic don't open, they wait outside, they come inside, they are seen at about 12 o'clock, they are upset, it is hot, um, people are stepping on people's toe, fights are breaking out, security is, is organizing things, and you are taking blood pressure. You are, they, they stand in a line and they walk up to have their blood pressure taken. All right, then the next person is standing behind them and their blood pressure is taken. And then you see numbers like 160 over 90, 170 over 110. And you're saying, boy, nobody in this clinic is controlled. Well, now the question, now the problem is what do you do because you haven't taken the blood pressure properly. And that is why my teachers used to say, after they've taken that blood pressure and they come into my room, I am to take my own blood pressure because they, they, they saw that there was a difference between the two, right? And you need the best possible reading if you are going to actually write a drug based on what you are seeing. All right. So K. Beagle believes when the blood pressure is taken properly, that, that you should be aiming for basically 120 over 70, less than 120, 120 over 80, that kind of range. And um, I am inclined to agree with them because when you actually do ambulatory blood pressure monitoring on these patients, you are seeing numbers easily in that range with, with good control at home. So in the relaxed state, that's the case. Now, what do you do? How do you actually approach this in, in practice? Number one, after you have obtained three such very good readings, 
you can decide that you're going to actually initiate therapy. And the therapy starts with salt restriction and exercise, basically lifestyle modification. And the reason why you start with salt restriction is that, for example, let's take a, a drug like Losartan. Losartan produces about a 35% reduction in proteinuria. And proteinuria is a major risk factor for CKD. If you salt restrict a patient on Losartan, it has been shown that that the reduction in protein urea increases to 55% just by salt restriction. You're gaining 20% reduction in protein urea, okay? And it's not a drug. This is just salt restriction. If you then add a thiazide to that, which then causes sodium loss, that goes up to 75%. However, there is a slight risk of hyponatremia and there is a risk of dehydration and volume contraction and some movement in the creatinine might occur, but this is how potent salt restriction is. So there is no pathway to treatment unless you pass through salt restriction, okay? Now, I know that that is difficult, but that's what dietitians are there for. You have to have the patient form a relationship with the dietitian and you have to continually counsel on salt restriction. All right, um, the preferred drug of choice, you hear me mention Losartan, are ACE inhibitors and ARBs across the board, except for maybe transplantation, which we're not talking about today. And that is easy to remember. The, a the ACC AHA guideline is not saying anything different. They're just saying the same thing in a different way. All right, they prefer to put ACE inhibitors first, specifically because of some evidence that they do have that ACE inhibitors may actually um, have a slight advantage in risk reduction, but the other guidelines tend to re um, view ACE inhibitors as equivalent to ARBs to some extent. So when you put everybody on the same slide, you will see how close things actually are. All right, so there is really no disagreement amongst the organizations about what you're actually trying to achieve. The disagreement is how you measure the blood pressure and what you should accept as the start of, of hypertension. But your goals are to get that blood pressure as safely low as possible, as tolerated as possible, and as close to 120 over 80 as possible. If there's CKD, you're using an ACE or an ARB as part of the regime, and chances are you will need a diuretic in combination with it. All right? Now, the Sartan, we're going to talk about Losartan tonight. Losartan was the first ARB that was actually approved by the FDA, and it was approved for three indications, the treatment of hypertension, reduction in the risk of stroke in patients with hypertension, hypertension and LVH, and treatment of diabetic nephropathy in patients with type 2 diabetes nephropathy and a history of hypertension. These guidelines come out of um, some very big studies, um, RENAL and um, the LIFE trial. We have been using Losartan for a very long time. We know that Losartan is a very safe drug. I've never actually had to withdraw Losartan for anything other than maybe hyperkalemia. All right, and out of its group, it has a very good profile in terms of um, indications compared to the other agents in the group. Some agents may have longer half-lives, but half-lives don't tell the entire story in terms of um, cardiovascular risk reduction. Now, ARBs in general prevent angiotensin II from binding to the AT1 receptor, and as such, it causes salt and water changes to salt and water handling that will improve hypervolemia in CKD. It will actually cause reduction in glomerular filtration, which will lead to reduced protein urea. It also has an effect on inflammatory pathways that are downstream from the activation of that receptor that can lead to fibrosis and um, cellular expansion in the kidney, which can then lead to glomerular injury. So as a whole, this is why ARBs and ACE inhibitors are chosen in CKD by almost every single um, body that defines disease out there. We mentioned uric acid earlier for the simple reason that Losartan is probably the only ARB except Herbisartan that can lower uric acid effectively, all right? It has an effect on the renal uric acid transporter, 
which basically causes increased uric acid excretion as a part of its mechanism. This mechanism allows a peak uricosuric effect to be observed about two to four hours after drug administration. All right. Now, other, other, other ARBs have been tested looking for this same effect. And although some of them may actually potentiate the effect, some of them may also reduce the effect, and some of them are not um, secreted enough into the nephron to actually affect the urate 1 receptor in vivo, but it might do so in vivo, in vitro. So in the end, only losartan and herbisartan actually was found to have an effect. And you can see the, the difference in serum uric acid levels from baseline when compared to the other ARBs. This is important because if uric acid actually turns out to be an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease and cardio and CKD, as it's looking like it may very well be if the statistics can be believed, then this puts Losartan in an advantageous position, especially since we have some data that actually shows more recently that use of xanthase inhibitors like allopurinol actually does not affect the outcome in CKD, even though it lowers uric acid level, which directly contra contradicts the earlier evidence. All right, take that for what it's worth. <clears throat> and this is basically say saying the same thing. Lasartan beats herbisartan, the only other drug in its class that has the similar effect in, in um, sub analysis of, I think it was IDNT study. Now, adherence and compliance, two sides of the same coin. This is important for our patients because compliance is literally probably one of the most important things you can check at each visit. If the patient is not compliant with your medication, then you're not actually treating the patient. They're just coming to see you, to talk to you, all right? Which actually may be beneficial in some ways, but you're not actually treating the patient. So if the drug is not well tolerated, then, you know, it, it, that's half the battle gone. Losartan is well tolerated and it's been shown that it's been, and it's not usually discontinued by patients due to any complication. All right, so this is basically a slide that goes over the Renal study, which was one of the landmark studies that allowed Losartan to be approved by the FDA. And this is a study that is done in type two diabetic patients, right? and losartan is add-on to typical treatment. And it was shown that losartan reduces proteinuria by approximately 35% and reduced the rate of decline in renal function by about 18% over the time of the trial. The composite endpoint of doubling of serum creatinine in end-stage renal disease or death was reduced by 16%, the risk of doubling creatinine 25%, and the risk of end-stage renal disease was reduced by 28%. These are good numbers, especially for a drug as ubiquitous as losartan. All right, so we come back to the role of serum uric acid again, and its unique effect with losartan. And when, when we actually looked at the renal data and looked at a subset of people with elevated uric acid reduced, we found that the overall risk reduction of losartan was actually due half one was actually due to one fifth of it was due to its effect on lowering uric acid, not just its effect on proteinuria, not just its effect on hypertension when those things were controlled for. Similarly, when compared with IDNT, when we looked at the difference in uric acid levels between these two drugs in their individual studies, the reduction of, of um, uric acid in the renal trial was far more significant than the reduction in uric acid in IDNT. The p-values were significant in renal, but not in IDNT. And remember, herbisartan causes a much lower reduction in uric acid than losartan, which may be part of the reasoning for that. Now, albuminuria and proteinuria are extremely important, right? In order for us to actually reduce risk in CKD with proteinuria, you must reduce proteinuria. The risk starts um, is amplified as you pass 300 milligrams per gram per day, and it continues upwards almost unstoppably. It, it does, there's no cutoff in risk. So the lower you can get the protein in the urine, the better the patient's kidney survives. 
right? And so we're talking about a linear relationship between albuminuria and reduction in the risk of progression to ESRD. And Losartan reduced albuminuria by 28% versus placebo. Now, if you're actually, in some of the earlier studies with ARBs and ACEs in kidney disease, one of the major criticisms was that creatinine levels of the patient was so close to normal that they were almost considered normal patients. And this was because in the initial days, people feared hyperkalemia. And when you're doing the ethics for these trials, you had to protect patients. This renal trial was one of the first trials where patients had real CKD. We're talking about people with creatinines as high as 300 micromoles per liter, all right? That was much higher than like in um, Ramipril and the other types from RAIN and those studies. So we could see that the risk reduction is almost the same across all levels of creatinine. So the drug works in people who are in CKD stage four, in stage three, stage, stage two, all right? All right. So this is just a, a summary of what we've been saying, that losartan reduces proteinuria, delays the onset of end-stage renal disease, and decreases the risk of cardiovascular events. And what does that actually mean to us and to the country? That means we spend less money on treating patients, right? You're talking about if in Europe, for example, when they looked at the renal data and they projected it to their population in terms of risk reduction, they would have ended up saving 2.6 billion euros just by prescribing losartan to the right patients, right? That's 2.6 billion euros. That is a lot of money. And if we think about our last budget presentation, although we are now a cash rich country, all right, we could still do to save some money, all right? Help Nigel. All right. So, all right. So, I'm not going to go back over the role of uric acid again. I think we have covered it. Um, the next slide there is basically talking about serum uric acid in cardiovascular disease and the fact that it actually is considered a strong possible risk factor for cardiovascular disease due to the mechanisms that we outlined previously. All right. Right. Now, what about patients that don't have diabetes? Patients with glomerulonephritis, patients with FSGS. All right, we've been talking Lusartan, Life Study, um, Renal, Herbisartan, IDNT. The things that come back, that, that tie those studies together is the presence of diabetes. And diabetes has a lot of proteinuria, it, it has a specific pathogenesis, so it's is the effect of Losartan, the good outcomes that we're seeing, is it, is it unique to just diabetes? Not if you believe this study. I mean, there are 360 patients in this study, and there are others like it, but we're seeing a definite signal that there's a 53% reduction in risk in terms of serum creatinine doubling, end-stage renal disease, or death in patients with CKD, not due to diabetes. Now, <laughs> All right. Is losartan as potent as amlodipine? Show of hands. No? Huh? Lowering blood pressure. Yeah. Well, this Japanese study showed that they were almost equivalent. However, this is a Japanese study. <laughs> right? If you look at, if you look at, if you look at black people, right, calcium channel blockers are the way to go. They are potent. Ask, trial, calcium channel blockers. Now, if you combine losartan, five milligrams, with, with amlodipine, five milligrams, and compare it to amlodipine, 10 milligrams, losartan, five milligrams plus amlodipine, five milligrams is superior to amlodipine, 10 milligrams. And that was a well-designed study, and that is true, all right, because of the the, the, um, the way they work together. But by itself, in our population, amlodipine is more potent than losartan in my experience. And don't know about the Japanese population, that, might, that is the case with Japan, but remember, two different sets of people, Japan is a monoculture. One type of person lives in Japan, Japanese. 
In Jamaica, we have a mix of people living here. Mm -hmm. So, we're almost to the end, all right? Losartan has been studied in major landmark renal trials. It lowers the risk of composite cardiorenal outcomes. It decreases the risk of end-stage renal disease, delays CKD progression, which can cause substantial savings, all right? It, it basically reduces risk across all levels of renal function, and we know that it has been studied in people with creatinines as high as 300 plus, so we can feel confident prescribing it, even though we need to check for the hyperkalemia in a timely manner after starting it, all right? And it also lowers serum uric acid levels. All right, so these are the key takeaways, and I'll leave these up. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> All right, colleagues, um, we'd just like to again thank Dr. Smith for his presentation on um, hypertension and chronic kidney disease. The floor is open. I know those of us who are here, how am I going to get the questions online? Oh, you have them. You have them. So um, because I know we're multitasking here and many of us are chewing, I'm going to ask, are, are there any questions online as we speak? All right. All right. So the first question we have, and I'll just repeat it because we have online guests, um, is the fact is, or the question is, are there required dose adjustments for losartan in persons who have significant renal impairment? No. Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, with any drug, if you're starting it for the first time in a patient with advanced renal disease, you start at the lowest dose and you titrate up. All right, that's the safest thing you do, and you check the potassium because that's what you're going to be worried about the potassium. Um, there was a recent trial, Stop Ace. Stop Ace. You heard about Stop Ace trial? No, but you Basically, a trial where they decided. <laughs> They followed a continuum of patients, a cohort of patients who were started on ACE and ARBs, and they followed them all the way to dialysis. And then they put them into two groups where once they stopped the ACE after CKD stage four and one, they kept the ACE going. And there was virtually no outcome difference between the two groups. So continuing the ACE didn't worsen them. And remember, because they, 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 and they were looking at CKD parameters, but ACE inhibitors also help the heart. And the heart is our target in CKD. So you, know, you keep your ARBs going for as long as you can get them to go for. And as high as the dose, you can get them to go for. Right. So take home message, no dose adjustment required, and you try and keep them as the highest dose without too much complication. Um, a question online. Yes, Alicia. Okay. So if a hypertensive patient develops hyperuricemia, um, as a side effect of a diuretic example, HCTZ, does this increase the risk of CKD? We're not sure. I mean, there are studies that suggest that it does. Okay? And there are studies that suggest that it doesn't. And when you look at the overall picture, right now, it, we don't know why in some studies this is happening and why in some studies it's not happening. So we have to wait for more data. But if you do have hyperuricemia, you do have to protect the patient against gout, right? It's very painful. And you do have to find a way to lower the, the uric acid in a way that can improve prognosis if uric acid is a risk factor, which it might be. So if you are using an ARB in that patient, maybe you should use losartan. Yes, we have another question. What level uric acid is uh, pathologic in hypertension? I think the risk starts at almost any elevation and then continues up from there. I don't think there is a, a cutoff above, above the normal that would then be um, norm, not associated with risk and then it suddenly becomes associated with risk if the pathogenesis of it is as they say it is. Mm -hmm. 
a question. Um, so you're saying that losartan is not contraindicated in CKD? That's correct. I don't, of course. That's, that's exactly correct. That's what I'm saying. The renal trial was done in patients with CKD. And what is the effect of losartan on virility? Oh, that's a very important question. <laughs> what, what's the effect on my erection? <laughs> Well, it would depend on how good the erection was before. Well, <laughs> but once again, I, I believe in patient-centered patient medicine. I prescribe losartans to people who have no issue with that. All right? And I prescribed water to some people who said the water causes it. So <laughs> once again, it depends on your patient. So I, I would actually just take it patient by patient. But I haven't really seen it as a big deal. Um, in terms of erectile dysfunction, personally. Okay. Uh, you, you, what? The online community is going hot, man. Yes. So the next question is, is the album, album, albuminuria uh, measured from a spot urine or 24 hours collection? Well, it depends on which one you prefer to do. Um, we have good data that suggests that the spot urine collection correlates very well with 24 hour protein urea when done by a proper lab. <laughs> okay. All right, great. Um, are there any in audience uh, questions for Dr. Smith? All right, so uh, we're going online again. All right, go ahead. Okay, so this is from Dr. Sonang. Uh, Lazartan has a short half-life. Um, BID dosing may be necessary in some cases. What is your recommendation? I personally don't dose Losartan BID. I've seen it dosed BID, particularly in patients with very severe proteinuria. But in my experience, I tend to use an ACE inhibitor when I need extreme proteinuria reduction and then an ARB after that if they don't tolerate the um, the, the ACE inhibitor. Now, if you are using an ARB and you're thinking about the half-life, I'm not a pharmacist, but some of the pharmacodynamics of losartan suggest that even though the half-life is low, the molecules that are produced in that half-life are still active in the system doing things. So I don't believe that um, the half-life tells the whole story where it comes to losartan. Because if it did, then you wouldn't really see these kind of outcomes as you did with, um, with life and with um, renal. On a once daily dose. Dr. Margaret? What would you use? Um, read the question of the allopurinol not um, being the best or being ideal or equivocal. What yeah. do you suggest? I know there's a, an alternative. Is it any better? It's more potent um, and it's less renotoxic, so they say, but it's, it might be cardiotoxic, might be. There's a little black box label on it from the FDA regarding cardiac um, issues with, with um, the other molecule. <laughs> So I use allopurinol because I have most experience with allopurinol. And if the allopurinol isn't working and the uric acid isn't going down, then I switch to the other molecule to see if that might help. But it's not first line. Um, isn't the other molecule safer in terms of renal, in terms of renal impairment? Yeah, in terms can, of renal. You can keep yeah. it going longer. Yeah, but remember the black box warning. <laughs> All right, um, colleagues, um, so I'm, I'm going to take Dr. Smith back a step um, in terms of we have been looking and the questions so far have been focused prior, primarily on the, the distal effects, the person who has CKD, person who has hypertension and so on. And, and I'm going to try and create a, a primary care scenario for you there, Dr. Smith. So. One of the things that we will traditionally do when we see our patient is, of course, try to do the blood pressure, um, hopefully in the way that you have described. 
Um, and, and then we would, of course, send the patient off for some investigations. Um, and, and that investigations would traditionally include our urine electrolytes um, and maybe do a spot protein, all right? When we get back that report, we often get back a report um, with those values, along with a value called an eGFR. Can you comment on the usefulness of that, if it has? Why are you asking me this question? Didn't you define a formula for eGFR? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Uh, the problem is the formula itself. Um, so if you're looking at the EGFR, remember EGFR is nothing more than a formula that uses creatinine plus some other variables. It's not telling you anything more than the creatinine is, you know. It's just being smoothed out in a curve using some fancy mathematics. So the EGFR can only tell you what is happening at that moment when that creatinine was taken. So in nephrology, we have a, a, a concept called steady state right this is very important this is what really this is how we sort out what we're doing right so if i have a single value of creatinine i don't have any information okay and if i have a single gfr i don't have any information all i can say is the function at this point is that now the function at this point could be that because the patient is dehydrated because the patient is obstructed in other words, nothing has to be wrong with the actual organ of the kidney, right? So the EGFR isn't telling me what's happening in the kidney per se. It's telling me the function of the kidney at this time. So what I need is another marker. I need a marker of kidney damage, right? And that's why they define CKD as decreased function for three months plus kidney damage because the function can go up and down during that time and it's not abnormal for it to do so if you live in a climate where there's, the, where there's sunlight baking down and then you can't get to water. Or if you're an agricultural worker, which are high risk, by the way, for, for CKD because they're in the sun all the time. They're working with herbicides. They're not drinking water. Um, they're working under some terrible conditions. They, they have a huge CKD problem in Mexico among agricultural workers and in the farm work programs where we see patients coming back from these programs with CKD. That's a different story. But looking at the GFR as a single point, no matter what they call it, you're looking at the creatinine as a single point. And what we need is a trend. Always need a trend. So if you see an abnormal creatinine in your office, you look at the patient and you, and you think, why is this, why is this creatinine low? Let's, let's start thinking about this. When you went to do the test that morning, you drink any water before you leave the house? No. You took a medication? Yes, doc. What was the medication? HCTZ and Lasix plus aldactone. <laughs> oh, all right, cool. <laughs> right? So the patient is dehydrated. So you repeat it. Right? So the question is do you refer that patient? Ah, but what I find in my clinic in, in Spanish town is that they immediately refer those patients to me. They would in the public sector. Yeah. It's called decreasing your workload. <laughs> <laughs> they immediately refer those patients to me with a creatinine from January 2020, being seen in clinic three years later for their first visit because of the length of time. So they're walking perfectly fine with a creatinine of 200 from 2020 as a new patient. So what do I have to do? I have to repeat the creatinine. So what you should have been done is that patient should have had a creatinine repeated. You look for factors that was causing dehydration. You look, you ask about things that might be obstruction. Um, if necessary, you do an ultrasound and you do a dipstick on the urine, and if you see anything that looks like glomerular nephritis, anything that you can qualify as acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury, you don't send that patient to my clinic, you send them to A&E, all right? Because you don't know what the creatinine is going to be in the next three days. But if the creatinine is stable, there's nothing in the urinalysis, they're hydrated and it actually starts to improve, then that's a patient you watch. And if it levels off over three months below, above the normal limit, and the GFR is less than 60, and there's some protein, that's CKD. Now, what do you do with CKD? If you're in England and you're a GP, you manage that till it's CKD st stage four yourself. Right? If you are in America, 
Well, that kind of, that differs from place to place. But if you're in Jamaica, I don't know. We manage them until they're CKD poor. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? Now, whether or not a nephrologist is necessary to manage a patient in CKD stage three to five, well, that, that depends. Some people think yes, but it depends on the level of training of the, of the general cohorts of physicians and what they are actually comfortable with. You can be comfortable with this. You can get comfortable with this. But if you're not comfortable with it, you can always refer and we'll bounce the patient back to you with a list of things to do and what to look for and you know, what you need to do and all of that. So that can happen. And I have been doing that in public system much to the chagrin of many people who I'm sending patients back to without, you know, because when they send a patient to you, they expect you to keep the patient forever. But um, three year waiting for new patient can't work. So I have to send, I have to send those patients back, all right, with a list of things to do and how to manage, all right? <laughs> sure. So, so I will speak on behalf of my Carbon College physicians to say that we believe in co-managing. Um, or patients. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we actually do. So the, the specialist has the role. Um, and so with any chronic disease, specialist has the role, the primary care physician has the role, and our other health professions have their role. And the, all roles are actually equally important. So as, as alluded to, one of the biggest and most important intervention you can actually do is dietary intervention, salt reduction. One of the things um, I didn't hear you mention though, um, and has gained some traction, is the whole role of vitamin D. I don't know. Well, I mean, no. I mean vit <laughs> vitamin D has been put forward as a, a cure for aging, right? So it it's modulates the immune system in so many different ways that um, it's difficult to pin down exactly what vitamin D is doing at any moment. We know that in certain areas of the world where you don't get enough sunlight, certain diseases are prevalent. Things like multiple sclerosis, things that are due to autoimmune diseases that are not quite easily identified. It's not the normal type of autoimmunity and they respond to vitamin D. As you get CKD and it progresses, you lose the ability to produce a certain type of vitamin D, right? 125 vitamin D, that vitamin D is important for bone health, it's important for calcium metabolism, and it is important to suppress a hormone called PTH. And if PTH escape occurs, well, I mean, that is, that, that's kind of, some people think that PTH may actually be a part of one of these new novel risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And some studies show that PTH elevation kind of ties in with cardiovascular risk, and people are trying to ascertain how much risk PTH can, um, put towards cardiovascular disease in CKD, but we're not there yet. We don't actually know that as a fact, but it's important that we control PTH and we do that through vitamin D. Now, if the patient is not getting enough sunlight and you, you may want to actually measure the vitamin D level, which is very expensive, yeah? Or you could just supplement a little vitamin D, the precursor molecule, right? Not, not at 125. You, you supplement the 125 based on the PTH level, okay? You don't want to start that too soon because it causes calcium absorption and calcium absorption in overload causes calcification of blood vessels and that increases risk. All right, thanks for that clarification. Now colleagues, um, I've been engaging Dr. Smith in a little chit chat, but I'm sure you may have other questions that you want. I don't want to monopolize this scenario. Um, are there any concerns, questions? We all manage these patients. Professor Reed, Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, online, go ahead. Okay, so this is a question from Dr. Annalisa Morgan. How would patients calculate their salt intake and does this require extra training to advise patients? Ah. Ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, there are several tools you can use as a doctor to train a patient for this. Uh, you can actually get online various handouts that show the salt content of various common foods, especially fast foods and, and snacks. And once you get it into their mind that a certain snack has a certain amount of salt and other snacks like that, they start to view as having the same amount of salt. So 
if they actually engage with the process, they kind of drive their own um, education on it by, by, by learning to read and look at the thing that they're, they're about to eat and checking it for salt. Obviously, they have to be motivated for that. But on your end as well, remember, you can test urinary salt excretion, right? So urinary salt excretion should be in steady state if the serum sodium is stable. Otherwise, the serum sodium will be going up or it will be going down. So if it's in steady state, then what goes in must come out, right? What, mo what goes in must come out. So you can't just do a urine collection, basically. Ask them to measure the salt in the urine in milligrams, and that told you how much, an idea of how many milligrams of salt they ate that day. However, if you give them a diuretic that causes salt leakage, you can't measure that yet. So you have to stop that. <laughs> you have to stop that, make it wash out, and then test the um, urinary sodium. So. I love water. <laughs> yes, you spoke about salt. You, you, you mentioned about the, the persons, the, um, the um, people who work outside, mm -hmm. uh, the farmers, whatever, mm -hmm. dehydrating and it causing yeah. them to end up in with a chronic kidney right. uh, uh, failure. Yeah. So, but, but then after a point, CKD three, four, four, you're now limiting the fluids mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Are you? Do you? What <laughs> no, do you I say? Don't. I don't limit what do you say to? Because uh, there are some who tell you to limit the fluid. I know. Um, there are reasons to limit fluid, particularly in heart failure. Okay. However, remember, <laughs> this is a, a question I ask the medical students all the time. Um, if you have a GFR of five mils per minute. Right? That's really low, right? What is the maximum amount of urine output I can get with a diuretic? If I were to measure it, 24 hours. Run that one again. The GFR is five. The GFR is five. What is the maximum urine output I can expect to collect if I put them on triple diuretic therapy? Maximum doses. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> you said I'm wrong. <laughs> seven liters. Seven liters? I can get seven liters from a patient with a GFR of five. Right? 24 hours, yeah. Because the five mils per minute is the amount of blood that is filtered by the kidney. Mm -hmm. Per minute. Multiply that per hour, per day. And you end up with a lot of urine. Remember, you know your blood volume would be filtered out of you within a couple of minutes if your kidney never reabsorbed in 99% of what it gets. So if I turn off that reabsorption, even five mils per minute can cause a huge amount of urine output. So in CKD, I, dis I hate dehydration. So I ensure that there's fluid because I can give a diuretic if the fluid gets too much. But I can't do anything if it's too little to maintain GFR. Mm -hmm. yeah? And a lot of patients end up, for example, let's say you have a drug like, like Losartan, right? And you have a patient in CKD stage four, and their GFR is, is 18, and you're starting the Losartan. Remember, when you start Losartan, you get a dip in GFR. Your GFR decreases. If your GFR does not decrease when you start Losartan, it means the Losartan is having no effect, right? So you're expecting a dip in the GFR. If that dip in GFR falls below a certain number, you can precipitate a few renal failure on top of CKD in that patient, right? So I like to have fluids available to the patient. If I'm also restricting that patient, they're on a diuretic and I'm adding Losartan, I'm setting myself up for a problem. So I like fluids to be present. As if they have thirst control and they can drink when thirsty, I let them drink when thirsty. Let the brain control how much fluid should be there. I've had, I've added Losartan, yeah, yeah. The, the GFR dips, um, if they become toxic, 
I stop it. Yes, what about the other thing that we are concerned, which we didn't bring up at all here, is SGLT2 and the... Yeah, the, the, yeah. so the SGLT2, they have a diuretic effect. That is not their mechanism of um, benefit, but they have a diuretic effect, which it's... <laughs> nobody really understands how it works. It has to do with letting glucose act as an osmotic diuretic to some extent, mm -hmm. right? Another part of it is that it changes the way mitochondria process energy. We don't know what that means. I have no idea how this drug actually works, but it works wonderfully. But what it will do, it will cause dehydration if you don't tell the patient to ex to ex their urine output is going to go up. They mm -hmm. have to drink. Now, over time, the body will kind of balance itself and they'll end up losing total body water if they're hypervolemic and come to a steady state and everything will be fine. Um, you'll notice the edema starts to disappear, right? Mm -hmm. But if you start that drug in somebody who might be dehydrated, you will see the creatinine start to rise, right? And you'll be going, oh, this is acute renal failure. Maybe I should stop the drug. You stop the drug, the creatinine comes down. Hmm. You hydrate them, you give them the drug, the creatinine just goes up a little and you say, okay, fine. And then when you check them again, the creatinine is back to normal and everything is great. But that's why I don't, I don't just borderline restrict people. It's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's why we need the specialists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yes, I think we are getting there. I, I will allow one additional question if there is. No, no more questions online? One more? Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, this one is from Dr. Ravi Avaru. Uh, my preference is to prescribe telomesartan over losartan. Exceptions are uh, conditions like gout or hyperuricemia. Uh, so do I need to change back to losartan if in the view of CKD, what is your suggestion? That's a good suggestion. That's a... <laughs> Remember, tell me sartan is also great for heart failure. They have an indication for heart failure. Don't any, no, hold on. Is that valsartan? No. Uh, tell, me, tell me sartan. Yeah. My yeah. In, in the EU. Yeah. So, I mean, it does good cardiovascular risk reduction. <laughs> Remember, with those drugs, you're also getting proteinuria reduction. Same way with telmisartan, you're getting um, reduction in progression of CKD. You might not get that benefit with uric acid, but you're getting a lot of other stuff. And if the patient tolerates it, I, I don't know if I would switch that, especially if the patient is happy on it and is tolerating it. If the uric acid is high, I might actually, I might, I might switch them if the uric acid is very high. But if, you know. Yeah, I might just put on an allopurinol on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, somebody's asking, what is the black box uh, warning for the competitor of um, allopurinol? It has something to do with heart disease. That's all I'm going to say. Check okay. it online. Okay. Yeah. The, the other question is, um, at what stage of kidney disease would you recommend a palliative care consult? Palliative care? Yeah, palliative care consult. <laughs> Hold on, so palliative care, so you're, you're assuming the patient is terminal. So you're going to say, we're just going to kind of make it comfortable. Um, that's a decision that is extremely patient dependent. I mean, remember we have transplant, right? So if you have CKD stage five in somebody that's maybe 90, you know, and they have dementia, they don't know who they are, and you have to, have somebody looking after them 24 hours a day, plus the movement back and forth, that might be unethical to extend their life in such a setting if they don't know who they are and can actually consent. You're not treating them, you're treating the, you're treating the family at that point, usually. So that's where we think palliative, and in, um, in nephrology we tend to call it maximal conservative therapy. Um, it sounds better. <laughs> okay, there's one more question. Um, at what point do you refer to the dietitian? First visit. The dietitian is in the room next to me. You just go out and then go over there, then leave. All right, so colleagues, um, I'm going to stop the question and answer now as we come to the end of our program right on time, 8.10. I'm told that I need to vote. Um, where's the ballot? Oh, oh, it's a vote of thanks. Oh, I, I was actually looking for the ballot. 
colleagues, um, I must say that I enjoyed the evening. I, I hope you did as well. And on your behalf, I would just like to thank Dr. Reddy, first and foremost, for sponsoring tonight's event and feeding many of us who are here. Those of you online, we thank you for at your participation, but unfortunately you could not participate in the sumptuous meal that we had here. Um, in addition to that, I would like to thank the, and, and, and by thanking Dr. Reddy, I mean all the, the staff, I see some of their sales rep and um, medical representative here. Hi guys, like to see you. Bring samples when you come. I'd like to thank um, Spanish Court for hosting us and, and, and providing meals for us. Um, I, I gather I haven't had my chance to eat my thing yet, but I think it looks good. So make sure there's some left over for me. And I would like to thank the audience for your participation, the fact that you came and um, we had a, a good interactive event. And, and, and for that, I must thank you and for your participation. For the Caribbean College of Family Physicians and our administrator, Lynn, would like to thank her for the support that she provides to enable activities like this to occur. And with that, um, Dr. Smith, we'd like to thank you for your sharing with us your knowledge and experience on, on this particular topic. So despite the fact that you went to Campion, um, you nevertheless turned out good. Um, ladies and gentlemen. I have been <laughs> my, my middle son goes to Arden. Oh, he's a smart one in the family. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having a good night and we wish you well for the rest of the evening. Safe journeys home, those of us who are traveling home. Those online, thanks again and see you at another time. I think we're having another meeting on March 22nd. Um, I think that one is focused on diabetes. And I think I'm the chair, right? Oh, dear me, Lord. Make sure you bring a nice proper high back chair right here. All right, see you then. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. See you on March 22nd. Stay safe.
going down.